College students, how are we? How many of you guys are excited to see some people get baptized tonight? Anybody excited to see some folks get baptized? Oh my gosh. I don't know if he just mentioned to you, but evidently because the pool's been out there, people have been coming up all day like, yo, is this a swimming competition? I mean, what's going on tonight? It was a kind of small pool for a competition. But anyways, we're baptizing some college students up in the house tonight, and we're pretty excited about it. Now, uh, one thing you've been sharing with you, some things you may not know about me. It's helpful to get to know a speaker better before you hear him speak. He's like, who is this guy? One thing you may not know about me, and this is total honest truth, I am terrified of public speaking. Would you believe it? I'm terrified. And here's, here's how you would know. My friend John, my friend John back here, John Gomez, he's with me a lot. I mean, before I'm up here speaking, usually on a weekend or here, like I'm jumping up and down. I'm boxing the air. I'm like, come on, what you got? What you, you know, I'm just hitting the air, okay? Because I'm like trying to get ready for this thing, okay? And you're like, why are you so nervous? I mean, you've been doing this for a while, right? I've been doing it for a while. Why are you so nervous? Well, when you get out here, and this is not going to help you, those of you that are fixing to take a speech class, okay? But I'm just going to tell you the truth. You get out here, every part of your body that can explode fluids and stuff wants to, all right, when you get in front of a bunch of people. Like you've heard the phrase, I feel like I'm going to pee my pants, and you're like, yeah, this is just a joke or something. No, try to speak in front of people, see what happens, all right? You will feel like you're about to do just that, all right, from the top and the things just want to come out, all right? So if I excuse myself in a minute, that's why, okay, so... I, I'm, I'm terrified. I'm an introvert. You might not know it hearing me speak, but I am. And so I do this because uh, the call of God on my life trumps my fear, but it's still uh, difficult. For some of you, maybe easier, but for me, it's tough. So don't think, oh, he's just so comfortable up there. Usually I'm like on the inside. Okay, so this is part four of a series we've been in called Breaking Free. Uh, just curious, how many of you guys have been here all four weeks, this being the fourth? How many of you guys have been here for all of them? Okay. Very good. How many of you guys, just curious, how many of you guys are first time tonight? First time to come tonight? Thanks for coming. Are we glad they're here? Thank you all for coming. Serious. Let me catch you up in case you're like breaking free from what? Okay, let me talk to you about it, all right, for a second. We've been talking about breaking free from addictions in our lives that seem to control us or that master us. And we defined addiction this way. It's practical slavery to sin. We got that out of Romans 7 in the New Testament, Paul. Practical slavery to some sin. So in defining addiction that way, we're able to say that all of us struggle with one. Could be pornography. Uh, could be shopping. Could be self-harm. Could be an eating disorder. Could be gambling. Could be drugs. Could be alcohol. I mean, we, we've all got some sin we persistently struggle with. We're calling it in this series an addiction because we become a practical slave to this thing. A friend of mine handed this to me, front page of the Toreador today. I don't know if y'all saw this. Heroin use, addiction increasing. It's an article about addiction to heroin increasing across our country. So this series, I think, is especially relevant. A lot of people struggling different types of addiction. And what we all would admit is we want to break free, but a lot of times we don't know how, right? And so we've been giving you some steps in the series. Week one, we said you've got to admit you've got a problem. You've got to raise your hand and say, hi, I'm so-and-so, and I'm an addict. You've got to get there. You've got to admit it you can't control it, that it's controlling you, and that you need Jesus' help. Paul said, Romans 7, the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. We said we gave away the whole series by saying that. You want to break free, the answer is Jesus. You need Jesus. So the rest of the weeks are steps Jesus uses to help us break free. So week two was confess. Week one, admit. Week two, confess. Confess to some people you're struggling. Quit trying to pretend to be perfect. We don't believe you. We know that you're not. Quit pretending. Admit that you've got a problem. And get some people to pray for you, because we saw in James 5, prayer is powerful. And it produces wonderful results. So we had a bunch of college students. If you weren't here, it was powerful. Come up here to a mic at the front and confess their struggles with sin. Week three, it was last week. Third step is to reconcile. To recognize that you and I, being that we're addicts, have hurt people. We have relationships in our lives with our parents, maybe with our friends, with the sibling, whoever, that are not right. And so I challenged you last week to get on the phone, make a phone call, send a text message, asking some people to forgive you. Man, we had people flooding the lobbies or people outside in tears. Some of you calling, getting things right with people. I'm telling you, it's powerful. I said, you're not going to totally break free until you also repair the relational damage that has been done by your addiction. We said breaking free isn't just about repairing the addiction, but also the relational damage done by the addiction as well. So if you've been tracking with me through this series, if you missed any of them, you can check them out online. If you've been tracking with me and also taking these challenges, hopefully you're starting to feel free. I think you should. 
because you've turned to Jesus for help and you've confessed to others and you're reconciling relationships. We've got two more <clears throat> steps I want to share with you. The fourth being tonight and then one more next week. And the one next week is going to be pretty quick. We're just going to have a worship night. That's cool with you guys. We're going to worship a lot next week. You guys excited about that? There's a couple over here. It's going to be exciting. Mark and the band are going to be great. So we'll worship next week, but I'll share with you a fifth step uh, for just a few minutes then. But let me take some time to share with you step four today. If you've got a Bible, hope you got one. You can grab a phone and get a Bible app on there. We're in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2. I've got some of these in the back if you'd like one. It's an easy to understand translation of the New Testament. 2 Timothy 2 is Paul's last letter. We've talked about Paul. He used to persecute Christians and became one. His last letter, for he's, they're about to, about to cut his head off in Rome for following Jesus, telling people about him. So he's writing to Timothy. Timothy's this guy led to the Lord. He's a young pastor. <clears throat> he's writing to him some final words, encouraging him. He's going through some suffering, encouraging him to persevere through the suffering. And then just also kind of saying some last words to Timothy. I mean, this is his last shot to talk to this young disciple of his. And so he says something I think is really important. I think it's key to you and I breaking free from the addictions that try to master us. 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. Paul says to Timothy, Run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. Run. Now, you know what that word run means in the original language? Run. Okay, it means run from, like run, like not walk, not skip, not hop, okay? Run from anything that stimulates youthful lust, like addictions when you had, that you had when you were in college, okay? Run from anything that stimulates those, that encourages those, that tempts you to engage in those. Run from anything, any place, or anyone that stimulates your addiction to a particular sin. You run. So if you're a drug addict, you're an alcoholic, going to a party where there are drugs or alcohol is going to stimulate your addiction, and he's saying, you got to run. If you're addicted to shopping, going anywhere near a mall, okay, could stimulate your addiction to spending more money than you have. You may need to stay away. You may need to run. If you're struggling with an eating disorder, and you're primarily hanging out with friends that are talking all the time about how important it is to be skinny and got to get skinnier, got to get skinnier, you need to run. If you're a porn addict, struggling with porn, you hang out with a bunch of guys, a bunch of girls looking at porn, uh, you're just going to stimulate your addiction to porn. You're going to have trouble breaking free. You've got to run. Now, here's what you're thinking. So, pastors, is what you're saying is that if I got some close friends that are, like, causing me to fall, that I need to, like, ditch my close friends? Is that what you're saying? No, that's not what I'm saying. That's what Paul's saying. <laughs> I'm not saying that. He's saying that, though. Because here's what you've got to understand. I'd write this down if I was you. You could tweet this. You could tell your friends it's important. You will not break free. As long as you are continuing to hang out with the people that stimulate your slavery. Read it again. You will not break free. You may want to break free, but you will not break free. As long as you are continuing to hang out with people that stimulate your slavery. That's true. Because they're going to bring you down. But my friend, they're my close friends though. You may need a new set of close friends. Because chances are you're not going to break free if by hanging out with them is stimulating your slavery to sin. Heard a pastor once say this, your friends, don't miss this, your friends will determine the direction and quality of your life. Your friends will determine the direction and quality of your life. You ever heard the phrase, bad company corrupts good character? Yeah, Paul used it from a poet. Corinthians. It's true. Hang out with the wrong types of people. It's going to influence you in going in the wrong direction. You've got to remember that college student. You've got to remember that. So he says, run anything that stimulates youthful lust. Then he goes on and says, instead, here's what you should do. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Like, run from things that stimulate your addiction. Run from things that encourage your addiction, things that you're struggling with. And instead, pursue God which leads to pursuing righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Like, pursue God. Don't pursue your addiction. Don't pursue the people or environments that stimulate your addiction. Pursue God. Why? Because He's better. He satisfies more. 
I mean, think about it. Reason with yourself. Why are you turning to this addiction? Why are you persisting in this sin? Because you're looking for it to satisfy you, right? You want to be happy, or you want to escape the pain, or whatever. And you're looking to something that can't ultimately do that for you. You've got to remember your creation. We've talked about this. He's creator. He created you and wired you to be happy in certain ways. If you rebel against those ways and you try to get happy or whatever by becoming addicted to some sin, it's not going to work. Because he's the one that wired you to be happy in certain ways. And the way he's wired you to be happy is in relationship with himself and following Jesus. He's just saying here, Paul's saying to Timothy, hey, remember this, I'm about to die. Remember this, run from the youthful lusts, okay? They don't satisfy. They're not going to take you where you want to go. You're going to hit the brick wall 32 times, fall on your rear end and be like, can somebody help me with this? Man, I keep running in the same direction. It's taking me nowhere. That's where a lot of us get with our addictions, right? We just keep hitting the wall over and over again, thinking it's going to bring the satisfaction, happiness we long for, and it doesn't. When are you going to give up? When are you going to give up on those things and recognize Jesus brings joy? Jesus, God, satisfies your longing. Not, it's not going to be alcohol. It's not going to be drugs. It's not going to be porn. It's not going to be self-harm. You turn to the wrong things, whereas your God is saying, turn to me. I'll help Turn to me. How long are you going to keep turning to these other things and hitting the wall over and over again? How long are you going to keep turning to them? Why don't you turn to me? Run from the youthful lusts. Pursue God. And then, watch this. This is, this is key. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. I'd remember that first. Paul said to Timothy, enjoy the companionship. Like here, Here's the kind of friends you need, Timothy. If you want to run from youthful lust, you're going to need some help. You're going to need some friends that can help you with that. Here's the kind of friends you need. Enjoy the companionship. Become friends of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. Like, you college student, here's the thing. You want to break free. You need godly friendships to replace your ungodly ones. Because godly friends aren't going to stimulate your youthful lust. And they're going to be there to pray for you. They're going to be there to help you break free. They're going to be there to help you overcome the addiction. Paul telling Timothy, it's going to be hard for you to run from youthful lusts, to overcome your addiction on your own. But if you enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts, it's going to be easier. Because they're going to be there with you. They're not going to pull you down. They're not going to drag you down back into your addiction where you're in chains. Nah. They're going to pray for you. They're going to help you break free. You got friends like that? Is that what you're doing, college student? You're enjoying the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. Because if you want to break free, that's huge. You need that. Step four is this. You want to break free tonight if you're taking notes. Is you've got to pursue. The word is pursue. You've got to pursue God and pursue godly friendships. Admit you have a problem. You confess it to others. You get relationships right. You reconcile and then you pursue. If you're going to run from sin, you've got to run to someone. His name is Jesus. So you pursue God. You pursue Jesus. And then you pursue godly friendships. I knew a guy growing up. And he struggled with drug addiction bad. I mean, he was in and out of rehab, and it was tough. I knew he needed Jesus. The answer is Jesus. He just wouldn't turn to Jesus, continue to struggle, and finally he did. He did. He turned to Jesus. He committed his life to Christ, and he, it seemed like he was set free for a season. But then he fell right back into the drug addiction again, and it was so clear to him and to all of us watching as to why he fell back in again. The reason he fell back in again is even though he committed his life to follow Jesus, He went back and hung out with those old friends that pulled him down. And they pulled him down again, even as a Christian. Their their company corrupted his character. And so he continued to struggle because he just thought, okay, I need Jesus, I want Jesus, but I still want these friends. What you don't realize is it's very difficult to break free if you don't separate yourself from the ungodly influences in your life. So in time, he figured this out recommitted his life to follow Jesus, and then he moved out of town. And he thought, the only way I'm going to get away from these friends is i got to get out of here. And he moved away, and I think he's been sober now about two, two and a half years, longer than he ever has been in his life. Because it wasn't just about pursuing God. As he pursued God, God led him to separate from some of these ungodly influences. He wouldn't initially. When he finally did, he was able to break free. College students, same is going to be true for you. You're pursuing God. God, I want you. I'm following after you. Help me break free. He's going to say, separate yourself.
from the ungodly influences. Are you willing? Separate, you're going to need a new core group of friends. Are you willing? Because your old group of friends, they're going to keep bringing you down. Now, that doesn't mean you start defriending people on Facebook, okay? Hey, we're not friends anymore, dude. Sorry about that. And it's not like that. It's just your close group of friends changes. You start hanging out more regularly with different people. It's not like you say to somebody you're not a friend anymore. You just separate yourself from the environments where you've been hanging out with them that have been causing you to stumble and fall. I'll show you a video. There's a guy that's college age in this group, comes to this group on uh, Tuesday nights. He struggled for years with a drug addiction. And he found this to be true as well, that the key was pursuing God. And as he pursued God, God would lead him to separate himself from the ungodly influences and pursue godly friendships. I want you to see his story. Take a look. It all kind of started um, my eighth grade year, uh, I guess getting ready to go into high school. That's kind of like when I first kind of had my uh, first experience, say, with alcohol. And it was kind of like my first taste of alcohol to uh, a few days later, my first time to try uh, weed. And so what, you know, started to be like, you know, maybe a once in a month deal going into my uh, freshman year of, uh, of high school to uh, about every weekend um, to my sophomore year is about every day. Before every sport and before every day of school, I'd wake up and, and smoke weed. I would take some kind of psychedelic, whether it be shrooms, or acid, ecstasy, just to try and, you know, I, what I would say is just try to enjoy life. And what led to me um, actually moving out with one of my friends and, you know, we ended up starting to deal together. And so I guess, like, from there, it was just absolutely downhill. Got into selling more to, um, to actually try and coke for the first time, to doing coke two times a week. There was no, like, you know, there was no reality whatsoever. There was no con connection with my family. Um, my dad had actually just sold my car and told me that I was on my own insurance, that I was all on my own, that there was no more support there. And uh, my brother um, resented me, he hated me. I was actually living with him before that and he had to kick me out. I didn't talk to my sister, uh, I didn't talk to my mom. And so I was just pretty much completely disconnected. I just remember thinking as I was sitting in that living room, I was like, you know, God, I'm going to give you one week um, to make a difference in my life. Any time I was straight, I was bored, I was depressed. I just felt like nothing good was going to come out of it. I just felt like socially awkward. Um, and I just kind of felt like there was no meaning to life. And so kind of like what that ended up leading to is me getting kicked out of school for it. Um, I was there and uh, I'd actually just got done smoking. The principal, you know, called me down to his, uh, his place and he was just like, hey, we need to search your car. Um, and so, yeah, they ended up searching my car and, uh, and they found some, some weed in there and uh, some alcohol. And so from there, I got sent to a, uh, an alternative school and, uh, and I ended up having to graduate from there. I didn't even get to walk. You know, my entire like, hope and dream was to uh, eventually one day, you know, go and play college sports. Um, and, you know, right then, right there, it was just over. You know, I guess I was just tired of, of uh, you know, lying to, um, I was tired of, you know, just living my life for nothing. Um, I guess the, like, the feeling of no hope. Um, and I guess when you know a little bit about Christianity growing up, you know, I guess you hear about Jesus, you hear about, like, all these things, but you really don't understand what it means and what he did on the cross. And I didn't even really at the time. And so, I just found myself to be interested. I, I saw like people that had shared their testimony similar to mine. Um, and I was like, you know, like, what is it that they live for? And so it just kind of created that general interest. I gave it that week and I, I began to get away from that crowd I was in. Uh, like, you know, I'd wake up in the morning and I'd just go home uh, and I began to talk to my parents. And, uh, and I remember, you know, my sister was like, you know, rather shy. And so she was like, hey, will you go to this, uh, this um, LTG with me? Um, and I was like, yeah, sure. And so I remember just showing up at this LTG and um, like hanging around all these people and stuff and, and kind of getting in this Chris, uh, Christian atmosphere. And, um, and just being in the atmosphere just kind of felt like it brought like me to life. You know, Jesus came and died for me. Um, and it's amazing to understand that, um, like how that actually changed my life from there. Um, I kind of like when I let go of that, when I let go of my, like, you know, kind of my past and stuff. 
and I had like all these new desires. I felt like a new person. I felt um, like I'd actually, you know, had a, like, you know, a reason to live. One thing I always struggled with is I hated the fact that I lived with no purpose and no hope. And uh, I guess to understand more of the cross and what Jesus did for me and then how he gives us this Holy Spirit, um, it guarantees what is to come. And so it guarantees that I do have purpose and that I do have hope. None of the hope that I could ever do comes, like I, put, I, I can't put my hope in myself. Um, all the hope that I had was in Jesus. So I, to know that like I am gonna be weak, but like when I'm weak, I can still put my faith in God knowing that He will be strong in my weaknesses. Let me thank Aaron for sharing his story with us. You know, his kind of recurring theme in the video is just how he felt like without Jesus, he had no hope. You know, the same is true for me. Probably many of you could testify to the same thing as well. That is, without him, what hope is there, right? In this life or the next, in breaking free, we can't. We've already tried on our own, haven't we? To break free, we can't. We been saying in this series we need Jesus' help. Jesus came to help, was tempted in all the ways we are, yet was that without sin so he can help us when we're being tempted. And then without hope for all of eternity, without Jesus. I mean, you know, if you had to be honest with yourself, surely you recognize if you get what you deserve one day, it's not heaven, right? Come on. I kind of came to that point in my life where I just thought, you know, everybody's arguing, I hey, get what I deserve, I'm such a good person, I'm going to heaven. I'm like, I know I'm not that good of a person. I know God's perfect. Heaven's a perfect place. Standards, moral perfection. I'm not going to make it. I have no hope. Unless somebody comes and saves me. Unless somebody comes and pays my fine, offers to do for me what I can't do for myself. I just recognize I had no hope without Jesus. Came to understand who he was, what he did. Turned from my sin. It's called repentance and said, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sin in my place to take my fine. Would you save me from God's prison, which is hell? I, I deserve that. That's where I should go, God. If you're a good God, I should go straight to hell. But thanks for Jesus. Would, would you allow him to save a sinner like me, an addict like me? When I prayed that prayer, he saved me. He forgave me of all my sin, past, present, future, brought me in relationship with him and did the same for Aaron. And then as an outward declaration, as a public response to let the world know as a follower of Jesus, I got baptized. There's a lot of college students going to get baptized tonight. They've already committed their life to Christ, but it's kind of like they're going public, wanting the world, and I'm a follower of Jesus. It's declaring I, I now have a new association. I'm associating with Jesus. I recognize that without him, I'd have no hope of heaven. And I just want the world to know I'm a follower of Jesus. That's what the New Testament says you do when you become a Christian, when you commit your life to Christ, you get baptized. Some people did it as a kid, their parents did it for them, but it wasn't based on their own faith. We should be baptized based on our faith in Jesus, the fact that we've committed our lives to follow Jesus. So I told the guys in, in the back that we, nobody's really prepared for this, but there's some people signed up to get baptized tonight out there in that swimming pool, but I'm thinking there's some people in here that just in plain clothes, you know you need to get baptized tonight. And... I think that'd be pretty awesome if you did it in your clothes. I don't know. We might have a shirt for you. I, no promises. All right. You can leave here soaking wet maybe, but maybe soaking wet, a new creation in Christ because you've committed your life to follow Jesus and you want the world to know about it. It'd be unbelievable. We got some towels though, I think. All right. We can dry you off. All right. We get you dried off. You go home wet, but I'm telling you, there are, I think 20 something college students already signed up to get baptized. Maybe many more just want to join them in your clothes. Say, Hey, I'm not ashamed of Jesus. I want the world to know I'm his follower. If the way it works in the New Testament is you commit your life to Jesus, then you get baptized. I'll go public. I'm in. You count me in. I want the world to know I'm looking to him to help me break free. I can't do it on my own. So I'll give you that opportunity in a minute if that's something that you want to do. A couple ways to respond. Three. One, pursue God. You're going to break free. By hanging out with them each day. And here's what I challenge you to do in just a second when the band starts to play. I'm trying to give you some real practical things to do. Pull out your phone in just a second. You don't have to do it yet. If you've got a smartphone, you need a smartphone. If you've got a dumb phone, you're in trouble. You need a smartphone. Okay, pull this thing out and download the Bible app. It's called the Bible app or U version. You can download this app and go to plans, like reading plans, and go to whole Bible with the whole Bible plan and pick a one year Bible plan. Hey, why don't you start tonight? It's going to give you a few chapters to read each day. But in the next year, you could read through the entire Bible. I guarantee every one of you would like to be able to say you read through the whole Bible. Most of you have not. 
Start tonight. Get one year plan. I do this every day on my phone. You can do it on your iPad, wherever you got. One year plan. It's going to give you a few chapters to read. It take you like seven minutes, ten minutes maybe. Spend some time with God. You can download another app I love. It's called Evernote. It's got a green elephant on the front, all right? It's just where you can take notes. You can make a prayer list. People in your family, friends you're praying for. And start spending time reading God's word each day and praying. Pursue God by hanging out with him each day. If you're going to run from sin, you need somebody to pursue. You need somebody to run to. Run to him. First challenge. You can do it in just a second. Second challenge. Separate yourself from your ungodly friendships by being honest with them. And here's what you need to say. Some of you may need to make a phone call tonight, some soon. You just need to say to some of your close friends, hey, I'm going to pursue God now. I recognize we haven't been doing that together. I'd love for you to come along with me. But if you don't want to, I understand. I just want you to know I'm not wanting to go to that place anymore. I'm not wanting to do that thing we used to do. I'm just, I'm not saying I'm holier than anybody. I'm not saying I'm all righteous or anything. I'm just saying I'm wanting to pursue God now. And that's just the direction I'm going to go. I hope you'll come along. And just want you to know, here's the hard truth. Many of your friends aren't going to want to come along. So moment of truth then for you. You're still going to say, okay, well, even if I follow Jesus alone, I'm going alone. Now, you're not defriending these people. You want them to remain friends, just not close friends, not influences, but friends so that when you break free, you need to separate from them in order to break free, but so that when you break free, you can then help them break free, okay? But you're going to have to get some distance or they're going to drag you down. Third, pursue godly friendships because you want to replace the ungodly ones with godly ones. Pursue godly friendships by getting involved here. Get to know some people here. We got volunteering opportunities. You can get to know a ton of people. We got groups you can get in. Get to know a ton of people because you can want some friends, some godly friends. Look around in this room. These would be great godly friends to have. These are people come and do a Bible study on Tuesday night, want to pursue God together. Make friends here. Get involved in a group. Get involved here. Do do something. But replace the ungodly friendships with godly friendships if you want to break free. Here's all I'm saying tonight: is you got to pursue God, and one of the things He's going to cause you to do, He's going to lead you to do is to pursue godly friendships as well and to separate yourself from ungodly ones. It's going to be hard, college student, I'm just being honest. It's going to be hard. But if you want to break free, if you want to break free, you might need some new friends. That's the hard truth. And again, the hope is the close friends you have now are going to want to go with you. You bring them here, they want to go with you. But even if they don't, the hope is once you break free, you can help them break free as well. Pursue God and godly friendships. It's key if you want to break free. And I think you do. You've been responding to these challenges the last couple of weeks. I, 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 something in me thinks, makes me think you're going to respond to this one tonight. So after I pray, you get that version app, the Bible app on your phone. You get Evernote if you need it. You start praying, pursuing God. Get involved here in this college group. And I can't wait to see God set many of you free. It's going to be great. Next week's worship night, and we'll do number five. Fix to baptize some people. It's going to be exciting. Let me pray for us. We'll be done. God, thank you so much for this clear text, 2 Timothy 2, that just says we've got to have godly friendships and we've got to separate ourselves from and run from ungodly ones. That's hard. It sounds bad. But God, I've seen time and time again, people don't break free unless they're willing to separate themselves from the ungodly influences. And so, God, I pray that you give college students boldness to do that tonight. They get involved here so they have godly friendships to replace the ungodly ones with. And I pray that their, their friends that are living in an ungodly way would want to come along with them, would want to start following God. But if they don't, God, I pray that as these college students separate from them and then break free, they'd be able to still have that friendship in place such that they'd be able to help them break free as well and start pursuing God. But we want to break free. Many of us have said we're willing to do whatever it takes. God, help us to be willing to even take this step to pursue you and to pursue godly friendships. God, we can't wait to see what you're going to do. Pray that many college students tonight that came in this place not planning to get baptized would say, hey, I'm standing up for Jesus tonight. It's a new day for me. I'm committing my life to follow Jesus. I want the world to know about it. Public declaration of a new association. Pray many people would publicly declare they're followers of Jesus tonight, even out in the freezing cold in a warm swimming pool. God, I pray a lot of people would get dunked tonight and this college campus would know about it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. For more information about our church or to watch other messages, you can go to our website at experiencelifenow.com. Let us know if we can serve you in any way, and we hope to see you real soon.